It's launching. It's finally here. It's no secret because AMD announced it and basically spilled all the beans a couple of weeks ago. But you can basically buy these now. Like, this is a thing actually going to be in Micro Center. And the first one that I'm going to take a look at is the Sapphire Pulse. 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, 128-bit memory bus. That's about 475 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. It has hardware AV1 encode, and it's just about $300. Well, $330. Maybe a little bit more for the AIB partner versions. This is the overclock version. You're going to pay a little bit of a premium for that. The 7600 XT is required by AMD to feature 40 gigabit DisplayPort 2.1 interfaces as well. Our Sapphire Pulse has two and two DisplayPort HDMI 2.1A. On the 7600, you weren't required to have DisplayPort 2.1. You had to have 1.4. Sapphire recommends a 600 watt power supply and the total board power is starting at 190 watts. And that's pretty reasonable. It does take two 8-pin power connectors. If you take a look at the card, the fit and finish works pretty well. Uh, this is a fabulous upgrade, I think, for any older GPUs that you might be rocking. Older, in this case, might even be a 3060. That's not that old. Indeed not. But we'll get to that. <laughs> Taking a look at the 7600 No XT in the past. This is the 7600 XT. What's the upgrade? Well, it's the 16 gigs of VRAM. I mean, that's what that's what everybody is going to latch onto. It's not really okay. The clocks are a little different, but not dramatically so. The XT uses a little bit more power, and yeah, the clocks. I don't know. It's a bit of a wash in my testing. Sometimes it's better, sometimes not so much. But 16 gigs of VRAM. Do you even really need that? I mean, the current AAA titles, no. But more than 8 gigs would be nice. I mean, 10 to 12 gigs would be kind of the sweet spot in modern AAA. So, for the future, would 16 gigs be better? Uh, probably. But also, what about 16 gigs for off-label uses? So you talking about AI? Yeah, maybe some AI going on in here. Physically, with the unboxing and the fit and finish, Sapphire has done a great job with the engineering and the cooling. It was uh, basically inaudible in the machine, the Fractal Defined Micro ATX, at a distance of six feet, the machine across the room, basically. Two quiet cooling fans built in. Sapphire knows what they're doing. Not really any hot spots as reported by Hardware Info 64. There was a lot to love. Just what we've come to expect from Sapphire. And this also be really popular with system builders because it's got built-in mounting grommets on the end. So you can secure it for shipping. It is, however, a 2.1 slot card. You might look at it and say, ah, I can, you know, deal with this. It's a two-slot card. And that's 2.1 slot. You could probably wedge in a NIC or something else. But if you're planning on a really dense system configuration, know that it's 2.1. Or if you're going to rock two 7600s for like a Linux VFIO build, then it's going to be problematic if you need it to fit in two slots. Now, AMD has also made a lot of progress in their drivers since the launch of the 7000 series GPUs that were coming in. This is uh, GPUs launching late in the 7000 series GPU cycle, and they've moved mountains, and they should not let up now. They should keep going. The GPU landscape as it exists currently has never been better for consumers in terms of features, innovation, and competition. AMD, NVIDIA, and heck, even Intel have legions of programmers pouring over every inch of what is mostly a device for entertainment. And the software differentiation is mostly the things that consumers have to look at. A market worth billions of dollars, to be sure, but AMD has consistently positioned itself as a company of fair business practices and open innovation. He's talking about GPU open, isn't he? Yep, GPU open. For the 7600 XT, AMD has positioned it as the direct competitor to NVIDIA's RTX 4060. And in a lot of games, the performance can be similar, but with upscaling and frame generation, AMD offers a higher frame rate and, dare I say, a better gameplay experience than the 4060. It's weird, though. It's a little weird. We need to talk about that. Before you, uh, you know, before you say, well, what about RTX and ray tracing and that sort of stuff? Uh, I mean, can you really talk about ray tracing with a straight face on the 4060? I can't. 4070, maybe, but 4060, come on. Okay, let's take a look and dive into the benchmarks. As always, we start with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This is an ancient title from 1276 AD that was commissioned to celebrate the leap year. Okay, we're just using this to make sure we've got our heads screwed on straight. 143 FPS, not bad. This title does not stretch our VRAM, and so the performance is very similar to that of a 7600 non-XT, all other things being equal. We can also see that stepping up dramatically 
in cost to the 4070 also performs quite a bit better. <laughs> That's kind of going to be the theme of this review, spend more, get more. But if you were rocking a 3060, this might be a compelling upgrade given what you could probably sell your 3060 for on the open market, at least before people realize this is what's going on with the 7600 XT. Next up is Assassin's Creed Mirage at 1080p. We can easily maintain 91 FPS with our 1% lows dipping to just 58 FPS in the worst case scenario, even though I like to target above 60 FPS for enabling frame generation, which would necessitate the use of upscaling, it is possible to achieve over 120 FPS with frame generation here. And AMD frame gen, you can get 150 FPS pretty consistently. Compared to DLSS quality, this is about a 30% improvement over with DLSS. That's an important key thing, I think. The improvement holds up at 1440p. Actually, 1440p Assassin's Creed Mirage, surprisingly fast on the ultra preset at 70 FPS. With, with FSR quality and frame gen, you can expect buttery, smooth, 120 FPS. FPS. It's strange. This is another one of those situations where 1440p is not really that much slower than 1080p. And in a lot of titles with this card, 1440p is an entirely reasonable experience. It's pretty awesome. Let's talk about how this frame generation stuff can change the way we think about benchmarking and benchmarking stuff. It's a little bit of a brain worm. And so I'm not saying frame gen is good or bad. I'm saying that if you look at it with and without frame generation, you get two different stories and maybe something to keep in mind. So frame generation as an upscaling technology is going to change how I need to explain how a card works, I think, and how you get actual gaming value. I mean, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. Fine. We'll segue. I think it will always be important to look at the raw performance of the card and use that as one of the pillars of supporting your own evaluation as to whether uh, this product will make you happy. I mean, just the raw performance. Give me the raw performance numbers. But... Modern Warfare 3 is kind of a microcosm of all the things that if your head is not in the right space, you'll probably not have the right takeaways from the reviews looking at the numbers. It's a great example of a game that when enabling FSR 3 with frame generation, uh, it's, it's a fabulous experience. But it's also a great example of a game where if you just run uncapped FPS, it will absolutely make 300 FPS feel like it's sub 60. And that's weird. But like, if you want to look at the number really high, I, I think it has to do with frame pacing. I had a much better experience with VSync on 120 hertz and FSR3 with frame generation than uncapped FSR3 on this one specific title, this Modern Warfare 3. Uh, perhaps that's an outlier, but the frame pacing really was not fabulous. With FSR3 frame generation, AMD recommends the game already runs at 60 FPS before you enable frame generation. So frame generation technology is really designed for high refresh rate displays. We've done reviews where you can get, you know, 144 Hertz display for just, just over a hundred dollars these days. And so it, it is pretty interesting for a lot of games. And for the purposes of testing, rather than playing the game, it can actually make sense to turn VSync off with the variable refresh rate. You'll see screen tearing, but this is useful for measuring the raw performance. But the raw performance doesn't always necessarily translate into the best gameplay experience. This is probably not how you should actually play the game either, which is why I've used all this to sort of point that out. Like you'll have a better experience with variable refresh rate and just letting it run at whatever your monitor is capable of. 120 hertz, 160 hertz, 144 hertz, whatever that looks like, you're, you're going to be better off. Look, this is, this is kind of the Wild West. I Intel bursting onto the scene here with XE CSS, XE SXS, which is actually a legitimately interesting and awesome technology like yay programmers there's also technologies like ray tracing and you know how we approach whole the graphics rendering pipeline when you have things like frame generation and upscaling and ray reconstruction and ray tracing amd has made tremendous strides with fsr3 since they launched it in september now i encountered game bugs while preparing this review and that was from both nvidia and amd if i go full ham fist i can come up with quite a bit where dlss still just does not work properly and has basic jankiness like the menus here in forespoken which by the way that b-roll that was on an nvidia card that i was comparing for testing and doing the review uh to be sure the amd card also does it but forespoken you can also make the foliage glitch and do other weird stuff. 
Uh, the other standout for frame generation and upscaling was Cyberpunk 2077. I know that game had a rocky launch. And, uh, you know, it really is, was it Gabe that said, is like, you can be late for a little while or you can suck forever. But I was able to go from a janky 50 FPS to over 100 FPS at 1440p with frame gen. And that also works on the 4060, but not as well. At 1080p, it never dipped below 120 FPS and mostly was higher than that. It was some really good gameplay. Unexpectedly good. And uh, I hadn't really messed around with it that much. A little bit. So, the, you know, Cyberpunk is its own special brand of jank. And I've experienced jank with Cyberpunk across uh, Intel and NVIDIA, especially Intel and NVIDIA and AMD. And, you know, a lot of that is down to the game. I mean, the single biggest improvement I've seen from AMD's software stack is HyperRX. AMD builds this as a feature that simplifies enabling performance features like Radeon Super Resolution and Fluid Motion Frames, Anti-Lag, Boost, and whatever combination makes sense for a particular game. You should check it out. It was good with Call of Duty, but for Cyberpunk and Baldur's Gate, it was also basically just point and click. I just turned it on. We got any Skyrim streaming grannies in the audience? Because HyperRx would be a great feature for them. So just hit that for whatever game you want to play. Play at the native resolution of your monitor. Probably going to have a good time. Okay, maybe a bigger improvement than that, but still kind of software stack adjacent. The integration and fixes for streaming and encoding, especially with OBS. I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago that OBS and AMD just didn't get along. But a lot of what AMD is doing is open, GPU open, as I mentioned before. While AMD does what it can do to make sure that it hangs on to the competitive advantages that it has with its GPUs and its GPU compute landscape, it also goes far and above the Call of Duty, uh, pun intended, to open up their technologies and sort of respect the ecosystem and make everything usable for developers. Take a look at GPU Reshaper. GPU or GPU Reshape. GPU Reshape is this really amazing piece of technology. Uh, it's going to be a game changer. Ah, oh, the puns! For developers working on games. These are tools to reduce human suffering for game development. And reducing unnecessary human suffering is always a benchmark that I look for. This will provide shader diagnostics and help developers track down issues uh, without having to be John Carmack levels of smart. Both gamers and game developers will benefit from a simplified software ecosystem. Really solid tools for development will speed game development and it'll take out some of the jank like we see in the menus with Forspoken. Until people report it, uh, you know, they don't know, because how do you do unit testing and end-to-end -end testing on things like this? Is From a software development standpoint, this kind of thing is really hard. And from an ecosystem standpoint, we've seen NVIDIA snub older generations of cards. See also RTX Voice, which is entirely unnecessary, but probably a decision made for support reasons, or at least support was probably the excuse. AMD's at a disadvantage here. They've got their desktop cards, sure, but they've also got RDNA in mobile. They've got RDNA uh, in... Uh, desktop CPUs, and they're pretty soon they're going to have APUs. At least those were announced at CES. And so AMD is sort of reworking their software foundation here to be more coherent, or they have been over the last, what, six months, eight months, uh, sort of, kind of. Like, at least, I don't know. That's <laughs> through the grapevine. And it makes sense that they're re-architecting their foundational stuff because, well, you can't make a delicious cake without breaking a few eggs. And AMD must not slow down at the egg cracking rate now. NVIDIA is distracted by AI. And now is the time for devs to embrace all the GPU open technologies. So a lot of words to just say that I had a lot of fun testing for this. Oh, and I did try ray tracing with the ultra preset in Cyberpunk 2077. It ain't pretty 24 FPS uh, upscaling or frame generation tech just is not a good idea at 24 FPS. And this is not a fair fight because the 4070 is in a different price class and it still only has 12 gigabytes of VRAM. The 4060 for ray tracing ultra, it's only around 28 FPS for me, the same ray tracing preset. That's pretty close to performance parity for ray tracing. So yeah, benchmarking games is weird with all this extra tech that's bolted on. Frame generation and upscaling tech is a bit of a balancing act between line go up and image fidelity. We're genuinely impressed with FSR 3 where it is today in 2024. The scrappy underdog might be pulling ahead if they keep focus, stay on course, and hire more devs to do yet more game testing. And some of that is also getting the game developers on board because AMD can't always just do the fancy pants runtime binary patching thing. You get into trouble with that, especially... You know, the things that we've seen where NVIDIA and AMD got in trouble with uh, competitive esports titles for trying to reduce latency and then that turned into a kerfuffle. And 
I don't know. Speaking of software development and fun off-label uses for these graphics cards, what about AI? What about non-gaming uses? Been working on AI options and, you know, like an options trader bot kind of thing. So what, what about, what about that? Well, it turns out 16 gigs of VRAM can be used with AI and AI type tasks. You're best off with PyTorch on Linux natively, of course. Be sure to check out our other video, Level 1 Linux. But you can use Shark to download the 13 billion parameter large language model and run it on this GPU. Some of these support uh, a direct Vulkan backend, and Microsoft is pushing something that they call Direct ML. And I was delighted that all that works with the large VRAM of the 7600 XT at this point in 2024 out of the box. It's basically the same speed as RX 7600 non-XT though, 8 gigs of VRAM. But with double the VRAM, it's possible to run much larger language models. Performance of the language model was basically the same at about 45 tokens per second for this particular language model. It's just that you can't run the 13 billion parameter model on the 7600, only the 7 billion parameter model. 13 billion parameter model, of course, runs fine with 16 gigs of VRAM on the 7600 XT. Nice. For image generation, the Stackyard AI can download models from Hugging Face and run them with the Vulkan backend just fine on AMD GPUs. The performance is reasonable for this card. Love generating Danny DeVito stuff. Creative workloads as well. The performance of the 7600 and 7600 XT are really close using Puget Bench. The extended VRAM is nice, of course, for larger projects. So if you're doing 4K video exports, more VRAM, more better. It's probably going to speed things up. And finally, what's my opinion, especially around pricing? Well, the 7600 No XT can be regularly bought for around 280, sometimes a little less. 8 gigs more VRAM for an extra 50 bucks? That seems like a pretty good deal. That seems reasonable. But the 7800 XT is a much, much better card, and it's come down to between 500 and 550 dollars. That's 200 dollars more, it's so almost twice as much. Well, not quite. But that card is more than twice the card this is. This card also makes things a bit awkward for the 12 gig 7700 XT. Like, okay, hmm, 16 gig 7700 XT on the horizon, maybe. Uh, there's no denying the software features, though. AV1, good OBS support, and that'll benefit all AMD users, no matter which card you pick. I don't think that this card exists to upsell you on the 7800 XT, and yet, it probably should. Oh, and this card also has good day one Linux support. Check out my other video for more information about that. <laughs> That's been a quick look at the uh, 7600 XT from Sapphire, the OC version with a, a mild OC. It's pretty awesome. The uh, 7800 also really good. This is the reference version. I don't have the, I don't have the Sapphire version. Ah! All right, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forms.